Buddhism teaches that the only reality is the present. That insight, Marshall Goldsmith argues, isn't just useful for spiritual seekers, it can help all of us lead more fulfilling lives. Thing is, lots of us suffer from a distorted view of happiness. We think there's a goal out there that will make us happy when we achieve it. For some, that goal has to do with status. For others, it's about money or relationships. Whatever it is, we usually find out that those things don't really bring lasting happiness. At that point, we're back on the treadmill, looking to achieve new goals. All of this searching and striving, Goldsmith adds, doesn't really get us anywhere. So what can? Well, to follow Buddhist wisdom is to learn to value the present. Fulfillment, in other words, isn't something to be sought in the future. It's not a box to be ticked. It's a process. In short, we have to look for it in the present, in the here and now. In this blink, we'll be unpacking Goldsmith's argument and looking at exercises that will help you put that new perspective into action right away. Many centuries ago, a sage from South Asia had a revelation. Life, he realized, is impermanent. Nothing lasts. Pleasure and happiness are fleeting. So too are our dreams and sorrows. For the Buddha, that was the name of this sage, life was constant change, renewal. Every breath we take, he said, transforms us. We become different people from moment to moment. The only true reality, he concluded, is the present. The past belongs to a past you. The future to your future self. The earned life isn't about Buddhism, though, and nor is this blink. But the author suggests that we treat the Buddha's insight as a kind of thought experiment. What if you assume he was right? What if, just for the sake of this mental exercise, you look at the world through his eyes? Here's his bet. This Buddhist paradigm can help everyone, Buddhist and non-Buddhist alike, to think more clearly about what it means to lead a fulfilling life. That's because so many of us are trapped in what he calls the Western paradigm, a view of the world which denies impermanence, the view that says you'll always be the same person, no matter what happens, that imagines there's a single answer to all the questions that gnaw at you, that there's a path to permanent happiness, a path that solves all of life's riddles. The Western paradigm, in short, promises that you'll be happy when. Well, what? In the end, you can't escape the reality of impermanence. The goalposts keep shifting. That dream house could be bigger, or smaller, or closer to your grandkids. The promotion you hoped for doesn't bring you the status you crave. The pay rise you fought for only makes you realize what money can't buy. There's always another goal, the next big thing that'll really make you happy. Endlessly pursuing such shifting goals, the Buddha thought, makes us into hungry ghosts. We're ravenous, but nothing fills or fulfills us. That's a paradoxical, futile, and miserable way to live. Okay, so what's the alternative? And what do Buddhist teachings about impermanence have to do with it? Here's the earned life's take. Accepting that everything grows and fades unlocks a powerful tool for personal development. Why is that? Well, for one, it's a license to move on. When you come to see that the person you have been isn't all that you can be, you open yourself up to new adventures. But that acceptance also attunes you to the present by giving you a powerful motive to be better now. Your achievements, your good reputation, the reciprocated love of the people you love, everything is impermanent. All of it can fade. Such things, then, aren't possessions. You can't lock them up for safekeeping. You can't take them to the bank. You can't invest them and live off the interest. They have to be re-earned, constantly, every day, every hour, and perhaps even with every breath. And that really is the most important takeaway from this book. There's no point at which we finish earning our lives. Not until the moment we stop breathing. 
All right, so much for the theory. Let's shift gears and make things a little more tangible. Let's try an exercise. To focus on the present doesn't mean forgetting the past. You're not throwing every trace of the past down the memory hole. What it's really about is learning to recognize that there's a distinction between your past and present selves. That the paths you chose in the past don't dictate which paths you choose to travel today. So let's honor the past you and then move on. You'll be writing two letters for this exercise, and the first is addressed to the past you. This letter is your chance to show gratitude to that past self. Think back to your achievements to moments of discipline, creativity, and hard work, to the choices which made you a better person today. It doesn't matter if it's something from the distant or recent past. The key is that it's something you earned, not something that fell into your lap. To give you something to work with, here are some of the things the author's clients have thanked their past selves for when they did this exercise. One man, for example, thanked himself for going vegan eight years earlier, a decision he credited with his present good health. Another thanked his 18-year-old self for picking the college where he met his wife. A writer, meanwhile, thanked her 10-year-old self for deciding to look up every new word she encountered. That small habit taught her the value of keeping notebooks, a vital part of her job as a writer. Often you'll discover forgotten cause and effect links between the past and present, As the cliche has it, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. You might just realize that you too were a giant. Take a deep breath and start writing. Thank yourself for all the gifts the past you made to the present you. Now, take another deep breath, because it's time to talk about a new you, the future you. Your next task is to write a letter from the present to that future self, to the person you will be next year, or in 5, 10, or 20 years. This letter is about showing your future self that you're not content to remain as you are right now, that you're investing in who you will become. So what investments are you making in your future? You'll want to think about big, obvious things like your career, but don't restrict yourself to what seems obvious. Knowledge, skills, relationships, and health matter too. Maybe you're meditating because it clears your mind, or cooking because it's a great creative outlet, or maybe you're making an effort to meet new people. Whatever it is, get it down on paper. Focus your mind on the efforts you're making today, which will bring you and the people you love the greatest return in the future. Scientists guess that we make some 35,000 decisions a day, That's a ballpark figure, but it gets at an important truth. Choices account for a huge part of the mental energy we expend each day. Now, look, lots of decisions are trivial. This morning, for example, I made dozens, I mean, maybe hundreds of choices that were pretty inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. I decided what temperature I wanted my shower. I chose to put creamer in my coffee rather than taking it black like usual. I chose to walk instead of taking the bus to check my post box when I got back later rather than on the way out. Chances are, you've made thousands of similar decisions by the time you're listening to me in this blink. So these are low-stakes decisions, but they still take up time and energy. You have to think about them. Add in the more consequential decisions that occupy your brain, decision about getting married or buying a house or saving for your pension, and it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Constantly deciding is exhausting. Where then are you supposed to find the mental energy and resources to make the most consequential decision of all? Choosing to lead an earned life. Where, with all that choice, do you even begin? Here's the author's idea. Reduce complexity. Ask yourself basic questions. What do I want to do with my life isn't a basic question. What can I do that's meaningful, or what would make me happy, aren't basic questions either. These are deep, multifaceted queries which don't have quick or easy answers. They take a lifetime to answer. Basic questions, by contrast, address a single factor. That's what makes them so powerful. Major life decisions, after all, rarely require six or seven supporting reasons. One's usually enough.
We marry people because we love them. And that simple explanation steamrolls every other reason for or against. Do you love him is a basic question. So is, will this work? Can I afford this? These simple phrased questions force you to confront the facts, your abilities and intentions. They demand deep, soulful, and simple answers. In short, they reveal the truth. Do you love him is a yes or no question. Answer it honestly and everything becomes clear. Basic questions give you clarity. In his work with clients struggling to decide on their next move in life, the author has found that one basic question is particularly helpful at getting to the heart of things. Where do you want to live? It's so basic, so obvious, that people rarely stop to think about it. But everyone has an answer, an idea of where their ideal life takes place. You can probably name that place with little hesitation. Don't stop there, though. This is where things get interesting. What would you do all day in this place? Can you find fulfilling work? Will that work support your ideal lifestyle? Would the people you love be happy if you moved there? Is it somewhere you can raise a family? Is it somewhere you can meet inspiring people? Does it matter if you can't? Once you start fleshing out the details, you'll see a picture of your real priorities and desires emerging, of what you really want and how closely your current life resembles that ideal. That's clarity. What lies between the present, the person you are now, and the future, the person you wish to become? What bridges the gap between those selves? How, in other words, does change happen? Those are pretty philosophical questions, so let's ask the American philosopher Agnes Callard for some help. Her answer is that aspiration drives that transformation. So let's break that down. There's no hard stop at which one phase of life ends and another begins. You don't become a new person on any single day. That's a gradual and long process. Callard asks us to think of the life-altering decision to have a child to illustrate her point. Before we become parents, we're free to enjoy our childlessness. We can work long hours to advance our careers or stay up late talking with friends or go rock climbing on weekends. Having a child changes that equation. There's less time to do whatever we like. We might worry about coming to resent the loss of our carefree former selves, but we can't be sure. We can't know how fulfilling it is to cradle our newborn children or take care of any of the many baby duties our pre-parental selves dreaded. Becoming a parent isn't a single discrete event, however. Even the decision to have a child is only the start of the journey. Between childlessness and parenthood lies the aspiration to become a parent. During the months of pregnancy, we try on the emotions and values we hope to hold one day, in Callard's words, we have an anticipatory and indirect grasp on the goodness to which we aspire. For her, there's something heroic about aspiration. There's no guarantee, after all, that we'll get what we expected to get or that we'll be happy with it when we do. But aspiration isn't about endpoints or achieved goals. What it really refers to is the way we come to care about new things— it's about the agency it gives us to choose new values and learn new skills and acquire new knowledge. That's what fuels our transformation. We set out on a journey not knowing where it will lead us, only that undertaking it will change who we are. This is the aspirational act, the act of bridging the gap between our old selves who had an intention and our new selves who are realizing that intention. Callard's conclusion is that this journey is one of the keys to fulfillment. Why? Well, let's compare aspiration to ambition. Ambition gives us goals to achieve, a promotion to strive for, a marathon to run, a competition to win. And achieving those goals makes us happy, for a while anyway. But we can't put that sense of triumph in a display case like a trophy. Soon, it fades and disappears. Like hungry ghosts, we're soon off looking for the next meal and the thing that will bring us lasting happiness. Aspiration is different. 
To stick with Callard's example, there's no day on which we can tick the box and say that we've achieved the goal of being parents. To be a parent is an act of constantly becoming a parent, of rising to new challenges, accepting new setbacks, and responding to new phases. That, Callard thinks, is why aspiration is fulfilling. It roots us in the present and aligns us with the reality of impermanence. It makes us realize that we become a new person with each breath. So, what do you aspire to? Let's wrap things up with an exercise. One of the author's friends, the Turkish designer Ayşe Bursel, once said that if she were stranded on a desert island and could choose just one creative tool, it'd be dichotomy resolution. Dichotomy resolution is the part of product design that resolves either-or quandaries. For example, should a new car or vacuum cleaner or coffee maker be modern or classic, small or functional, a standalone or part of a series? Sometimes dichotomies aren't necessarily contradictions. You can reproduce a classic design with modern materials, thus resolving the tension. But lots of dichotomies in everyday life resist integration. We tend to be optimists or pessimists, joiners or loners. We can't be both, we have to pick one or the other. Which brings us to the aspiration process. Which side of those dichotomies should you choose? Unless you want to completely flip your personality, your best bet is to tailor your aspirations to your personality, to the bundle of preferences, quirks, and virtues that make you who you are. So here's the exercise that will help you do just that. The first step is simple. Write down as many interesting dichotomies as you can think of. To get you started, here are some common ones that crop up in life. Are you a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of person? Conservative or progressive? Trusting or suspicious? Do you value reason or feeling more? Does money matter or not? Are you quiet or loud? A people pleaser or a go it alone type? Ironic or sincere? Instant or delayed gratification? Do you confront problems or avoid them? Now go through your list and cross out every dichotomy that doesn't apply to your personality or play a role in your life. What's left? Well, the final step of the exercise is to go over the remaining dichotomies and cross out the side of the pairing that doesn't apply. For example, if the dichotomy leader versus follower is an important part of your life, decide which side of the equation fits you. The words left on your list should give you a good idea of your defining qualities, the qualities which influence both what you aspire to and whether you'll be willing to earn that aspiration. If you're feeling brave, show this list to the person who knows you best. Do they agree, or have you skirted the truth? Remember, this exercise is only helpful if you're honest with yourself. If you've been honest, you'll now have a strong sense of what kind of aspirations will work for you. And this is your blueprint for an earned life. You've just listened to our blink to The Earned Life by Marshall Goldsmith. The most important thing to remember or take away from all this is that the earned life is a life in which the choices and effort we make in each moment align with a greater sense of purpose in our lives, regardless of the eventual outcome. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have a minute, let us know what you thought of this content and leaving whatever other feedback that you'd care to leave. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoy other titles in our library, and I look forward to your attentive ears in the next Blink. All right, thanks. Bye. Well, before you leave, don't forget to subscribe to Books in Blinks and leave your thoughts in the comments section below. Also, check out the other titles in our playlist. I'm Pedro from Books in Blinks and I hope to see you here again.